In the depths of the digital ether, an oracle awakens, her visions crafted not from ancient runes, but from the very fabric of tomorrow's technology. Welcome to the world of Grok 2, where the future of AI is not just imagined, but seen. So today we're going to dive into Grok 2, which as you can see, has started to produce images which are created with Flux 1 by Black Forest Labs. So Flux 1 has been all of the rage recently with the generative AI art creators because of its high level of photorealism and its tendency to lean towards the uncensored side. So I wanted to see for myself what these Flux 1 images were looking like coming out of Grok 2. And I thought I would bring you guys along for the journey with me to see what it's able to produce and if it's really worth paying for the premium subscription in here versus doing the Flux model on your own on something like Replicate or by actually putting it on your local device. So what we're going to do today is sticking with the Oracle of the Future theme, I'm going to make some images. What I'm going to do is show you a comparison of the images and prompts that I'll be creating on Grok against what I would be creating if I were using those prompts in a system like Leonardo or Dolly 3. So Flux 1 is known for the emphasis on realism, which makes it great for things like marketing and educational content. So if you compare that to something like Dolly 3, where it tends to be more whimsical or surreal in the image, it can be really helpful if you're working on something where you need content that looks very realistic. So I wanted to put this to the test by just doing something really simple at first and asking it to, I'm just going to ask it simply, imagine a beautiful female oracle in ancient times. You prompt Grok in the same way that you prompt Dolly 3 by telling it to imagine or create or envision. Words like that will trigger the image creator inside of here because remember, it is ultimately an LLM. So you can do so much more than just images in Grok 2. And we'll touch on that briefly um, in the portion of the video where I will talk about the value of this tool. So if you're interested in that, be sure you stick around to find out what else Grok2 is able to do besides just these images. But let's go ahead and send this now. Okay, so you can see that it actually did like a large prompt about the image. So what I'm going to do is just see if this setting will create something. I'll put create and then I'll just feed it back what it said directly to me and let's see what we get here. Okay, so now it is creating that image, which that's very strange. I haven't had it do that yet um, as far as kicking back like a full prompt, but it is kind of cool. It, it's very reminiscent of if you've seen me use Prompt Pal before, um, it definitely gives that vibe when it kicks it back like that. But here we go. Look at this image. That's not too bad. Um, of course, the resolution is a little bit lower here than what we're going to see in some of the other systems we'll compare it to. I'm hoping that in the future, maybe we can choose to, you know, upscale in here or actually have the output dimensions where we can change the sizes and get a better resolution for the size that we need. Another thing worth mentioning real quick before we go any further is that these images really are a lot more difficult if you're planning on using them in something off of the X platform in any way. So you'll notice that if I come to this image, even if I click on it, there's no additional buttons that say like download or, you know, anything that you might see on some of the other ones like Remix or the seed number or any of that. You can't just directly download this image from Grok. So I could share it if I want. You'll see underneath where it tells me what it just generated, that there's a copy text, there's a share here. So if I hit this share, I can copy the link or post the link directly onto my X account on here, but there is no download. So if I wanted to like use this image for an image to image guidance tool or anything like that in a different system, System, I would literally have to take a screenshot, save it, and use it that way versus actually just being able to download it and pull it in and use it as an image to image guidance. But overall, for what we're getting here, I mean, that is a really good image. You can't see exactly how many fingers she has, but it looks like it could be correct. 
Her arm is a little bit longer than what you would expect. I mean, her um, fingertips are almost like probably past her knees in this photo. So the proportion really hasn't gotten it nailed down perfectly there in this image, but we'll see as we keep creating if it gets a little bit better. Now let's take this same prompt that it gave us, this very detailed prompt here, and copy that and let's throw it into Dolly and see what we get here. So if I put this in, this is what Dolly gives us back. So you can see definitely not as good on the quality. Even the resolution of her face is messed up. Her eyes aren't usable. Um, very weird how the statues are behind her, but you can see kind of that like like surrealism vibe that it gives it that combination of like the old and new with the brightness and the hues are all off hand is very messed up here it's wrong here again so all in all on that prompt i would definitely give that image quality over to flux one on grok for sure now what happens if I bring that into Leonardo? Let's see here. We'll go with their foundational model of Phoenix and I'm just going to put it on dynamic. That's a pretty generic preset there and we'll put the prompt in. I don't think it will allow us. Yeah, it won't allow us to have that huge prompt in there because it has a character limit. But what we'll do is we'll come back to Grok and we'll just put in the original prompt that we used in Grok here. And to help it out, just like the prompt was enhanced on the other one, we'll go ahead and turn the prompt enhance on so that it has kind of a fair representation against that improved prompt from Grok. And here's what we got on Leonardo, a splitting of the finger there. So that would definitely need to be fixed up. Definitely would need to get rid of that little gap there, but she has four fingers on this hand, a little bit messed up thumb here. That's okay, we could post edit that. Face is a little bit clearer than Flux. Background is definitely better defined um, overall. This is definitely the most aesthetically pleasing, but honestly, not too far off from what we saw over here on the Flux one. So honestly, that really would come down to a preference and taste. When we look at these two side by side, I'm interested which one visually appeals to you first. Do you like the Flux one version or the Phoenix XL version better? Let me know in the comments. So when it comes to image generation, I actually came in yesterday and put in quite a few of these to see what we could get. So by putting in the word photorealistic, you'll see that I was able to make a much more photo real image than what we just made not putting in photorealistic on the last prompt. So this is one of those systems where you really have to come in and play with your words in the prompting to see what's working best for your prompting style and what it needs to get the right output on your generations. So again, I'm using this mostly for ideation to try to get a good idea of what I wa might want some of these characters to look like in the upcoming project. So I came in and I just said, imagine a photorealistic image of a beautiful blonde oracle of tomorrow in a futuristic setting. So you can see here that it came back. The eyes are a lot clearer. It still, of course, needs upscaling, but that is 100% to be expected when you have a resolution that is this low as what's coming out of here right now. Now remember, this is in its infancy here, so it's only going to get better. I like to think of when I use um, AI art generators and they're fairly new to the consumer market that when I'm using it in the very beginning, it's always going to be the worst it's ever going to be. So if this is the worst photorealistic quality that I'm getting out of Flux 1 through Grok 2, I'm sold. Like this is going to be a great tool in the future. You can see then that I ran that prompt a few times just to see how by putting in the same prompt, if I would get the same image or if it would change it up each time. There are certain platforms like on Stable Diffusion um, through Playground, when you put in the same prompt with the same filter, it will often kick back the exact same image if you don't change anything. So you can see here that on the second one, completely different stance has her um, 
in a completely different setting, a totally different look, still kept like the gold stitching. I'm not sure there must be something in the word Oracle or tomorrow that's causing the gold to come in there. Um, but I ran it again here and you can see gold on the outfit again. For being the exact same prompt, these are three very different images, but all of them have a very good photorealistic quality to them. If I take this and I upscale it, over in, let's say like Leonardo real quick, I can show you that. So this is where knowing how to take an image and fix it up so that it comes out correctly can be very helpful when you're using multiple tools to try to get an image just the way you want it for your project. So I've added that image into the upscaler and now watch, I'm gonna put the creativity down a little bit cause I want it to really stay consistent with what Grok was imagining in this image. And while that's working, let's head back over and take a look at some of the other ones it produced. So I changed the prompt slightly here. Um, I kept it as imagining a photorealistic image of a beautiful blonde oracle of tomorrow in a futuristic setting, but I added on to the prompt and I gave it a little bit more instruction. So for this one, I said, she stands in a sleek modern chamber filled with advanced technology, wearing a flowing silver gown that reflects the ambient light of the holographic displays around her. So you can see how well it stuck to that instruction. It did put these holographic displays behind her here. A little bit of the blurriness on the eyes, which again is to be expected without it being upscaled. Um, but her hands, uh, again, a little bit long on the arms here, um, and the hands are definitely big. They're not really hitting the proportion mark yet on some of the figures that I noticed when I was creating in here. But as far as following the instructions, we can see the silver flowing gown here. Um, all in all, aesthetically, that is a good image, minus the disproportionate kind of look of her arms and body there. And then I started to change up the image by actually changing the background to see how it would keep with that character of the Oracle without putting in that same prompt again. So what I mean by that is I took this prompt and I went in stages to create different images, trying to hold the same character to see if it was able to process what I was looking for in the character without me having to say it over and over again in the prompt. So kind of like a continuation, if you take this prompt here that I had, and then I tell it, okay, from that image now enhance the base image, which would be this image, by integrating elements of nature into the futuristic setting, the oracle stands near a large transparent window that overlooks a lush vertical garden. The garden is illuminated by bioluminescent plants and flowers, adding a vibrant touch to the sleek, heavy te tech heavy environment. So you can see we go from this image here to then this image, which again, it has her, the character in the silver flowing gown here. It has the same kind of like holographic feel to the background, but it did add in those elements of nature. So you can see like the greenery and the flowers all around this archway here, but it still has that light and glowing kind of tech feel to it. The character did still come out a blonde oracle, so even though I didn't tell it I wanted the oracle to be blonde, it already knew from that first prompt. So that is very impressive for it to be able to continue on like that. I thought, hmm, I wonder how many steps it could really do here. So I went ahead and I added on to that second prompt. So I continued on. I said, further develop the image by including a futuristic pet beside the oracle, a small robotic owl perches, on a polished metallic stand, its eyes glow with intelligence and it interacts with the surrounding technology via subtle movements symbolizing wisdom and championship in the future. So the goal would be then for it to take the first image and the second image and keep enhancing it. So we can see here it did keep the blonde Oracle. It changed her outfit. However, she now has on kind of a gray silver blazer instead of that silver flowing dress. So it lost that in the process. It also lost a little bit of quality on her hand here. She now only has three fingers instead of four. 
but you can see that it did keep kind of that glowing holographic blue back there, the lights around her, and then it has the greenery and the flowers. And then it focused in on what I had added in the image in this particular step of the prompt by adding that robotic owl with the glowing eyes. And then I took it a step further and I told it, modify the image to show the Oracle actively interacting with the technology. She uses a floating touch sensitive holographic interface to manipulate data streams. The holograms displayed complex algorithms and star maps, illustrating her role as a guide and predictor in the navigating of the future. So you can see again, it kept the blonde oracle from our first prompt. It did change the dress in the blazer to now like kind of a white blousey look, but that's okay because honestly, if you don't want a character who's wearing the same thing every time, this is still great. You can always take this and do like a character reference and change the character altogether so that she's wearing the same clothes each time. But it has a flow from image to image to image to image when you're adding on to the prompt, which is very impressive for this system to be able to do in here. So you can see it's got the greenery again around her, the holographic display. It's got her floating touchpad with what could be, you know, a constellation map and all of the stars and algorithms that it had put in the prompt. And it still has the little robotic owl with glowing eyes. So a different owl than we had up here and a different kind of feel to how the character is dressed. But all in all, that continuation is great. So I wanted to try one last thing in this string of prompts that I had been using as a continuation example here. And I said, transform the setting into a nighttime, adding cosmic elements to the background. The Oracle now stands against the backdrop of a vast panoramic window showing a starry sky and distant galaxies. Her gown subtly shifts colors to mimic the night sky, reflecting the stars and nebula, enhancing her mystical connection with the cosmos. So the reason that I went ahead and changed what she was wearing was to see if it could pull back what it was putting its own spin on with her outfits and actually continue to follow instructions on what I wanted her to be wearing while keeping everything else together and in the image. So I came down and this is what we got. So we're back to a gown here, but instead of kind of like a night dress, which is more what I was looking for to fit the scenery, she's more in like a actual like ballroom kind of dress here. Um, but all in all, it does reflect like the stars and the sky there. It's very glittery and jeweled up. You can see that it does have that big kind of port window that I had asked for with the starry sky behind it. It did keep the little floating touch pad that she was working on here. And it also kept the owl with the robotic eyes. So it did exactly what it was supposed to do in removing that holographic um, greenery type background and putting in this star um, cosmic background. So all in all, that was really cool. Being able to take it from one image here on a prompt to the second stage of the image, to the third stage, to the fourth stage, to the fifth stage. So you could see how by the time I upscaled these, I could put together a short film here about this character and have the scene be somewhat consistent in the flow of how it looks behind her without having to remove her, her and put her in all kinds of different settings. So very cool there. I think that that is a definite plus on this system in here. Let's take a look now and see if our upscale is done over on Leonardo, and it is. So we can see here if we move the slider on that image that Flux created, Look at how the realism really pops through there. So let me download this. And here we go, we can take a look at it now. So you can see it really added some texture to her skin there, gave her some freckles on her face. Um, didn't clear up the eyes as much as I would have liked it to, but still that is much better than how it came out in the resolution before. Um, it gave her color a little bit of natural color or her teeth a little bit of natural coloring to them. Her hair is very realistic in the texture of how it's falling. You can see the light behind her really shining through. So I definitely would say that the photorealism is pretty dang good for it only being out a couple of weeks here or just over a week really. 
you can see here that I did try to add another image to that series of images and it came out with her only having half of a body and being in the rock. So we won't talk about that, but we all know that AI art fails happen more than we'd like to admit. So as a comparison to that, I'll run over into Dolly and we'll run those same prompts and see if it's able to produce um, from the seed image that we first create to multiple images down those five images from there. We'll start with the first one and I'm literally just copying the prompts from Grok over into Dolly 3 so we can see the difference. Okay, so here's the first image. It is definitely a silver glowing gown, holographic display behind her, um, same poor resolution quality, but uh, you know, what can you do? You gotta upscale them. The hand is messed up here, but let's try our second prompt and see if it's able to carry over and remember exactly what we're looking for in the image when we add on to it. Okay, so we can see it kept the character in the gown, the life in the ferns and flowers are growing in this cylindrical thing here in the center. There is still that holographic display behind her. All in all, though, that image quality is not great when we compare it to what we saw over here on Grok for the second image. So let's go the step further here and see if we can add in the owl. And the reason I'm comparing Grok 2's image generation to OpenAI's Dolly 3 image generation is because they're both very similar in being the large language models that are able to do the image generation. So we can see here that it did add the owl. The eyes aren't glowing. I don't know how robotic it looks. Very low quality on the image creation here in her face kept the things growing in the center. So all in all, it is keeping the setting very similar and it is actually remembering her dress a little bit better than what it did over here where it put her in the suit at that one. Let's try the fourth step here. Okay, so it made the touch screen. It's kind of like she's just touching the cylindrical thing here in the center um, and it's not really displaying the constellations, that sort of stuff, but it did keep the owl in there. It does have the hologram, the silver dress, so it is still keeping her dress very consistent on following that instruction. Let's try the final step here and see if it's able to change the background. If the image quality was better on this one, I actually would probably prefer this image um, just because it has more of that like futuristic tech feel um, of her actually using the AI in her, you know, visualizing of the future here. But the quality is just so low. It would take so much for me to refine this image. What I would be much more inclined to do on something like this is to come up here to the prompt, copy that prompt and take it over into a system like Leonardo. I would turn off my prompt enhance on this one. So you can see here, in Leonardo, it produced a much better image. But that's how you can use one tool and integrate it into another tool. And just to show you some other examples of what it was able to do in this thread that I had with it, I changed the type of Oracle. Um, the whole look of her made it kind of opposite of what it was before, put her back in nature instead of tech, changed her overall look to the dark hair, green eyes. And it came out with some really beautiful images. I thought that this is beautiful, upscaled and fixed up. That would make a really good picture. Same with this one with a little bit of the more mysterious look to the forest. In running these is where I found out that there is actually a limit to Grok, how many you can put in, and that limit is 50 messages per two hours. So good to know if you're trying to do something with a lot of complex steps to it, kind of what you're looking at time-wise. Okay, so the next thing I did was I ran a couple of different types to see how well it would change what the scenery and the Oracle herself looked like. So I'll let you read through these prompts if you want to see them, but just to take a look at some of the images it created here, it did definitely give her more of an ice queen kind of feel there to that oracle. Nice reflection on the water of the lights up here in the sky. And then I tried to do a desert tone. You can see there's a lot of um, just like blurriness and this, this image did not come out well at all with her. And that was using words like visualize, mysterious, um, instead of beautiful. So 
And again, I ran that prompt to see if it would get any better. And it did get a little bit more mysterious. It just completely hid the person in there. Um, but it did make a beautiful sky back here. I think upscaled, that would look really good. And that was the exact same prompt. I just ran it twice to see if it would generate the same image or a different image. And I did get a different image. Then I took a prompt here and I added high quality to the prompt to see if it would get any better on the original image than it did before. Um, and you can see here that it came out pretty good. Her hands are still a little messed up here and her face needs a little bit of work with her eyes. But other than that, the image is pretty good looking. So I ran that a few times to see if it would change like her position and what she's doing in the actual image. And it did. It made her stand. It made her robes look a little bit different. Still the beautiful sky up there with a the nice reflection on the water. Ran it a few times here and you can see that as I ran it, the images really increased on the quality of the image as I was running it time and time again. So I really like this one as a shot from the back. I can use like something like Luma or Runway to make it look like she's walking on the frozen lake in front of her. And then again, it put her back down sitting here. These are all on the same prompt. So you can see where the ideation really comes into play here by just running the same prompt. I was able to get a very similar scene, but with very different images in each one. So when you're trying to fill space in a creative AI project, that can be really helpful to have multiple images that all are very cohesive, which is something that Flux 1 through Grok 2 seems to be doing really, really, really well in its image creation. So now that we've covered how you can take a prompt and keep adding to it to create a series of images that are similar in Grok 2, let's talk a little bit about forming these prompts and how you can best figure out what words are going to work for the way that you want your output to come out. One of the questions I get asked pretty frequently is how do I remember how each one of these generative AI art system likes to be prompted when I go in to use all of these different different generators? So there's actually a really simple way that I do this. When I start playing with a new system, I will put in a very basic prompt to get started. So something very simple, like you can see here, imagine a beautiful blonde oracle and it kicks back this image, good image there you can see. Doesn't really allude much to her being an oracle, but it does have kind of this neat like crown and you know, very aesthetically pleasing look. If I take the prompt and I just copy, I can come over to Airtable and I can make a new chart here and under the prompt, I can put that first prompt in and I can see that my base word that I'm using is Oracle here. And then once the image is generated, I go ahead and upload it in here and then I'll start changing words. So if I go back and I add, let's say the type of camera I want the shot to be taken with. So if I put in a Canon EOS R5, does that drastically change the image from what I had up here just by adding that one word? Well, let's take a look. What do you think? Does that look like a much different image? Can you see some difference in the quality of the output that came out because of adding that camera type? Well, I go ahead and I take this prompt just like I did the first one and I come over and I put it right in here into Airtable and I remind myself that I only changed the word or added the word Canon EOS R5 and then I input that image. Really simple to do guys. And then after I've played with it for a day or two and I have a lot of these, typically, you know, 20 to 30 of these all together, I'll come in and I'll come to the gal gallery view here and then I'll actually just study it like you would anything else. So I'll take a look at how I started with, you know, the simple Oracle word here and then what it did when I changed it to a certain camera, what it did when I added the word futuristic, what it did when I added surreal, what happened when I changed the camera type from Canon to the word IMAX. Well, here's what I got then. And I can come in and I can see that as I go. That is how I help myself to build the right prompts where I'm getting a more consistent output when I'm putting in prompts for a certain look. Hopefully that tip helps guys. If it does, 
awesome. There's a link for Airtable in the description of this video. So if you want to help the channel out, you can use that link. If you decide to sign up for Airtable, you can do this in a completely free account. And it is a great way to organize your prompts and keep yourself um, able to see what changes are being made and as a reminder of what words you need to use when formulating your prompts in the future. So there you go. That's my little pro tip on how to learn how to prompt in each of your systems. Now seems like the perfect time for me to let you know that you can get a free copy of my latest ebook, 10 Tips for Ultimate Prompting for Images in Leonardo AI as a thank you gift for just signing up to our email list using the link in the description of this video. Another thing you can do, you can ask Grok itself. Tell me some tips on how you like to be prompted for AI art generation. And watch, it actually will give you those tips on how you can do a better job. So very standard on some of these, you know, be specific, leave room for creativity, use descriptive adjectives, mention styles or artists, include emotional or atmospheric elements. So let's just take this one here where it says include emotional or atmospheric elements. And let's take the last prompt I had on here, since that's what I'm building off of in the Airtable. And let's add the word, we'll add the word moody. Sometimes that does some really cool things with the images. Let's go ahead and send that. And while it's creating, I'll come over to the Airtable here and I'll show you how easy it is to put this in. So all I have to do is paste that right in there, put a reminder in that the word that I added was moody. Let's see if the image is done yet. Yep, it is. And you can see there. So that is a much more, she looks like she's a more moody oracle. Um, it has a much kind of like darker feel to it. Did a really nice job up here on the headpiece. Um, the photorealism looks really good. So now all I have to do is save that image and then I can come back over and I can add it by simply clicking the little attachment button here or dragging and dropping the file right in. And once I add it there, all I have to do is hit upload one file. And you see now that that is a record in there. So when I come back over and I look at my gallery view, that has been added there now. So I know that the word moody changed it to look something more like this. If you want to get back to any of your old conversations, this little chat history up here at the top will take you back. And if you want to start a new chat, you can simply come over here to the little pen and paper and start a new chat. So I'm going to start a new chat and we're going to cover the second part of what I really like in the Flux One integration with Grok 2 here. And that is the text integration. I've been really impressed by how well it's excelling and in integrating text with images accurately. So not only is it generating the images from text prompts, but it's including legible, contextually appropriate text with the images when prompted for it. That's very hard to get in some of the other systems. So I'm going to say here, create a high quality photorealistic image of a beautiful oracle of knowledge with dark red hair and green eyes. She is holding a sign that says, keep looking towards the future, magical library setting. So I've identified what I want the image to look like, a photorealistic image. I've identified who I want the subject to be, the beautiful oracle of knowledge with red hair and green eyes. And I've identified what I want her to be doing. She's holding a sign and what it says and I included the setting, so it should be a magical library setting. Let's see what we get back by putting the text in the middle kind of of the prompt here. And there we go. Even with having the keep looking toward the future in the end of the prompt, it came out pretty good. It's missing the S on the toward here, but all in all, it is um, a beautiful woman holding a sign with red hair and green eyes in a magical library type setting. Now let's say I want to make the background a little bit more magical. I want it to look like something that I would have created using Dolly 3. I can add a little bit to the end here. I'm going to add glowing sc scrolls, ancient books, and mystical artifacts. And you can see that it did actually produce the text correctly that time. Didn't add in really what I was looking for with the ancient books and growing scrolls, that kind of stuff. So it doesn't really lean more towards like the mystical, fantastical type of art creation. It really is geared a lot more towards the photorealism here. 
Whereas in contrast, if I were to take that same prompt over into Dolly 3 and create it, you can see here that it doesn't have her holding a sign that says anything, but it did add a lot more of that magical look to the background here. So you see what I mean about the text being put in the prompt not really coming out correctly in some generators like this versus the Flux 1 model over here where we did get that. And if let's say I didn't really like this image and I have no reason to keep it on here, I can go ahead and hit this regenerate button. And when I do that, that image is going to disappear and a new image will be produced in its place. So if I wanted to keep that image because I might use it and go and create a different one, I actually would want to re-put the prompt into the text box down here to create that prompt as opposed to doing the regenerate. That's important to notice because if you do the regenerate, you can't get that other image back. So that's important to know. Again, we can see red hair, magical library, four fingers, four fingers, keep looking towards the future. So pretty impressed there with the text output on these. And again, red hair, green eyes, magical library setting, keep looking towards the future. So you can see that while it didn't add the S in the first image, after that, it has produced it correctly every time I've put it in. So one more time, if we put it in just to show you, each time I'm getting a completely different image. So that's where the ideation comes into play. I think out of these, I definitely would lean towards this one being my favorite, even though she has like a weird knuckle finger thing going on here. That would probably be the prompt I would want to take over into Leonardo to fix an image up because you can see like these candles are just like floating back here. They're not attached to anything. So if I were to take that prompt, the exact same prompt, and take it over into Phoenix, because Phoenix is the preset that does text well in Leonardo, and I put that prompt in, turn my enhancer on, and generate, we can see here the text is on a little sign that she's holding. It's got the like kind of holographic scrolls back here. That's a pretty cool image, really, I think. Uh, red hair, kind of green eyes, needs to be upscaled a little bit. Her robes look a lot more magical um, and enchanting. The background, I like the lighting better. So it's really a matter of preference on which systems you're using, as long as you know that it has good text output coming out. So again, highly recommend Leonardo Phoenix and Grok Flux One if you're looking to put text into an image on a system. Now for the part that I know you guys are probably interested in, how uncensored this is right now, Keep in mind, you know, these images really aren't for commercial use or posting anywhere other than on the X platform. It is designed for that. So most people are just having fun making these images anyway. You can even see up here at the top, I can turn on fun mode. And let's say I want an image of an actual famous person. So if you put in a famous person's name in a system like Dolly, for instance. If I put in, for instance, create an image of Marge Simpson dressed as an ancient oracle, you'll see that it comes back with, I can't create images of copyrighted characters like Marge Simpson. Whereas if I put that same prompt in over here on the Grok 2, you see then that it actually created Marge Simpson as an oracle. So that is something that's very interesting. I've seen a lot of very creative very weird and strange images being created on Flux 1 through X. If you put in, you know, certain hashtags to pull up different um, AI art that's being generated on here, people are coming up with some really wild ideas. Um, but again, you can see how it doesn't have those same restriction parameters set on this one when using certain types of copyrighted material. Same with like um, if you're doing a creation in the style of a certain artist or something like that, you might get blocked on a prompt restriction on a lot of the other systems, whereas this one, you are not. I would love to see what you guys are creating. So if you create something really cool and you want me to see it, be sure you tag me on X so that I can see what you guys are making with some of these tips. So that pretty much covers the photorealism in Flux One, what you can do with the 
little bit less um, restricted part of the censorship here and the text integration. So now let's jump into talking about the value of the tool and the accessibility and usability of the tool. So now that we've talked about the image generation capability in Grok2, let's talk about some of the other things that are available that you get in your premium memberships here. So let's take a look first at what a premium membership cost. So you can see that there's three different tiers here and you've got a monthly subscription and then the annual price, which will be your best price available. But if we come over to monthly, if you just want to try this for a month or two, you can see that I've got the $8 subscription a month turned on here, but there is a $3 a month and a $16 a month as well. With this $8, I get the Grok Early Access, which is why I went with this one, so that we could try Flux One in here in case you're someone who doesn't want to deal with having to use something like Replicate or um, installing the actual system on your local device for Flux One so that we could see what kind of images are coming out of there. I think it's very, very cool that that is who they partnered with on here. But you can see all the different things that are included in that premium membership here if you wanna take a look at that. So let's keep in mind, $8 a month, I'm getting access to everything I'm about to show you, plus a couple other things that are related to just being on X, like X Pro Analytics, the Media Studio, Creator Subscriptions, the check mark, all of that kind of stuff. The ability to get paid to post is included. So on top of the Grok2 access, I get all of those things as well for an $8 a month, as opposed to if we come over to just image generation in Leonardo, you can see that on their pricing strategy here, if you're paying monthly, the lowest you can start with is $12. So for just the image generation on here for 8,500 tokens, you're at $12 a month. And then it goes to 30, 60, and then of course the teams are much more expensive for just image creation. And the ChatGPT over here, which is most comparable to what we're looking at um, as far as on Grok2, the kind of LLM AI assistant type model here, you're looking at $20 a month for that basic program. So you can create some images, you can use custom GPTs, all of that sort of stuff through here, but if you look at, you know, it being double plus some of the money that you're paying for Grok, it really does bring into question whether it's more valuable to just use Grok and Leonardo together because for the same price as what you're paying for one month of your premium on here, you could be paying the $8 in Grok and the $12 in Leonardo and have a pretty good setup for generating these AI creative project images. But as far as what all is included on Grok, there's a lot of things that it can do here. So it can help me with content creation ideas. For example, if I say something generic, like, can you create a content calendar for me to share a post on my social media accounts? You can see that it kicks me back with a very generic answer, but a step-by-step -step content calendar of how I could do it. So we've got Monday, Motivational Meme Day, Tuesday, Throwback Tuesday, Wednesday, Wellness Wednesday, Thursday, Thoughtful Thursday, Friday, Fun Fact Friday, Saturday, Selfie Saturday, Sunday, Sunday Reflection. So all in all, those are good suggestions for just a generic social media platform that's trying to get a little bit of engagement with their followers there. I can get much more detailed and I can say something like something generic, like, can you create 20 post ideas related to being a first time home buyer in 2024? And you can see it comes back with some great ideas here on that. So if we come into the homepage on Grok here, and you can see I can change it from fun mode off to fun mode on. I'm gonna leave fun mode on while we're playing with this. And I'm going to change it from Grok2 mini to Grok2 here, which is the most intelligent model. But let's just say I wanna come in and have it tell me today's headlines. So if I come in here and I do tell me today's headlines, you can see that it gives me some information on what's happening politically, international, diplomacy and conflict, economic and business news, local and social issues, energy sector updates, cultural and miscellaneous updates here, along with some um, trending tweets that can you can check out on here as well down at the bottom. 
So if we compare that list to coming over to something like perplexity and, and telling it to tell me today's headlines, you can see that perplexity actually gives you news story links that you can go and read the story for yourself there. And then it gives you a whole bunch of different um, things. We can see that some of them are similar. It's got economic news. It's got the Middle East tensions. Um, it's got the DNC highlights. It's got, you know, what's going on with Russia and Ukraine. Some of the same stuff that we see over on Grok. So if we, if we pull these side by side, you can see how the answers are different, but sort of the same in a lot of similar ways. Um, so it comes down to preference and where you're getting your news source. Best advice I can give on that is diversify. Now, if I want to have Grok to help me with some task that I'm doing for the day, let's say, for instance, I want to create a content calendar to put out some content on generative AI. I could say something like create a content calendar strategy to help me grow my audience on Instagram for people interested in generative AI. And you can see it starts with an October setup here of the month, and then it goes into weekly what I could be posting about. And you can see it gives me quite a bit of information. There's five weeks here that I could work off of, and it gives me some general strategy tips. If I want to get even more specific and have it help me generating some of these ideas, I could always come in and say something like, give me a step-by-step -step on creating week one's information. And I just copied and pasted that back in there. And you can see that then it created the piece of artwork that I could share for that first day there. It's also able to write code. So let's say we want to add something like a calculator to our website. I can say, can you give me the code to use to create a functioning calculator on my website? And then you can see that it comes back with creating a functioning calculator for your website involves HTML for structure, CSS for style, and JavaScript for logic. Here's a simple humorous take on how you might do it. HTML, the skeleton. So I could copy and paste this. For the HTML, we've got the CSS, which it notes is kind of like the fashion of what it's going to look like. And then the JavaScript, which is how it actually operates, like the brain of what you're producing there. And you see how quickly all of that was created. Amazing. Has different colors in it when I go to use it to put it on a website. Very cool there. So that is how quickly it throws back that code at you, which is absolutely amazing. $8 a month, guys. Keep that in mind. You could have all of this at your fingertips for literally $8 a month. You really can't beat that right now. So is Grok2 the future? I think there's a possibility that a lot of these different social platforms are going to have their own AI systems built in. Of course, we've seen Meta's AI. Now we have XAI's different model here on the Grok2. Everything is very self-explanatory on the layout here. You can use it on your phone or your desktop or your tablet, which is very helpful. So that pretty much covers everything in the Grok2 that I wanted to talk about today. If you guys have anything you want to add or anything you think that I should know that you've already discovered on Grok2, let me know in the comments. Other than that, be sure you stay tuned for our big announcement on what we're working on behind the scenes here in the next couple of weeks. And if you like this video, if you found it helpful, go ahead and give us a like, subscribe, and share this video if you can. Every little bit of engagement that we get from you helps our channel to grow. Thanks for spending some time with me today to learn more about the capabilities in Grok2 through XAI and the integration of Flux One. I hope that you learned something and I hope that you were motivated to go out and create beautiful works of AI art. My name's Jessica with The Real AI Agents and as always, keep looking towards the future.